And while they're, they're playing with that, um, I'm here to set the, the mood. I'm here as an evangelist, okay? Uh, so if you want your company to change, uh, you probably want to have me come in and sing the song. I'm here to tell you that, first of all, you're doing it wrong. The second thing to tell you is you're godlike figures, and your company doesn't know it yet, okay? Um, obviously, I'm not a godlike figure because I can't make my... Huh. All right. We've lost it. Um, pull it out. Let me just uh, do my slides as, I, uh, as though they're local. This is going to make it somewhat more challenging. Okay. I can dance. I don't even have my slides. All right, I'm here to talk to you about a, at a uh, project called Axiom. Axiom is a computer algebra system. Um, and uh, I worked on it uh, when I was at IBM Research. It was a, an innovative system. It was the first general purpose computer algebra system. Uh, it did the annoying things like doing your uh, equations that you used to have in high school. And it does, uh, it is one of the largest computer algebra systems in the world. We worked on it for quite a few years. Uh, it had about 300 people. It was about a $42 million project. It ran on for 21 years. Uh, at one point, Reagan cut the uh, funding for the federal labs. And when he cut the funding, the IBM decided that, well, we're not getting any external funding, therefore we should just sell this program. So we had to document it, of course. And um, because in the day, this is back in the 1970s, you have to understand, we were actually, and I'll, I'll put up the next slide here, except it won't even come up. My computer's completely frozen. I love it. So back in the day, this is 1970, we were working on systems where you could do 4,096 characters. When you did the 4,097th character, over 4K, the system crashed because you had 8K of memory. Okay? And the other 4K was used by the operating system and the editor. So you tended to make little tiny files, and you had include files. And that's, if you look at that C book, you know, they, they had little C things, and they had the include idea. And you had these little trees that you built up of all the code. So um, you ended up with huge trees of buried code, and it all had to have a build system to put it all together. And that's the way people program now, which is astonishing, because we have systems that have 32 gigabytes of main memory on these things. Um, it's all right. I really lost the thread. Okay. I have no idea where it's going to go at this point. So this is completely extemporaneous. So... Um, when IBM decided to do the documentation on this, we went to IBM standard. IBM has a standard for documentation. It has to be written at the eighth grade level. Our system uses univariate polynomials over the field of integers. Uh, it, it, it was going to be a challenge. And we, we tried, and it, it was hugely funny. But it never got anywhere. So we found an external company that had a science... Uh, library, and we sold it to them. It's called the Numerical Algorithms Group in England. And they marketed it for seven years. And our system was built on a LISP that was built specifically by contract for us by a guy named Bill Shelter. And he shared my office. And at one point, I found out that Bill Shelter had died. My son called me and said, Bill Shelter died. I called Barry Traeger, which is a guy I worked with, and um, as a godlike figure in the whole computer algebra area. And he said, by the way, did you hear that NAG's taking Axiom off the market? I said, what are they going to do with it? Well, they're going to throw it away. And no, they're not. So I called them up and said, can I have it? And they said, yes. So, so this is like calling up a car dealer that's going to get rid of a car, and they give it to you in a dumpster in parts with some of them missing. So I got this thing, and it took me about a year to put it back together again. Um, and I open sourced it. And there is the bear that got me in trouble. Uh, I started looking at this code. Now, mind you, I wrote some of this code. And I write dirt simple code. 
And I'm looking at the code, and I know exactly what it does. I can tell you. I've taught compilers. I have taught for years. I can tell you the bytes it will lay down in memory. I can tell you what the machine will do. I know what this code does. I don't know why I wrote it. I know if I take it out, the code stops working. Uh, so I need it. I know I need it. I just don't know why I wrote it. So I, you know, circled the chair a few dozen times and said, well, what's wrong here? What's wrong is I have 1.2 million lines of common Lisp code with no comments. Okay? Uh, it's been written as the PhD thesis work for people who are leading edge experts in computer algebra. It is world class. Some of the algorithms in here exist nowhere else. These people have written algorithms which have rewritten what Isaac Newton has done. Okay? I'm looking at this stuff. It's very valuable. But I can't contact some of these people because they're dead. Okay? And the seance person still communicates at the eighth grade level. <laughs> so it's, it's something of a challenge for me, right? So, so I said, all right, what's the problem here? Well, I've run into the problem that we didn't write down the why. Nowhere did we write down the why. And it turns out that the why is really, really, really important. So, again, circling the chair in the opposite direction to sort of keep the, you know, conserve the, the universe. Um, I looked at this and said, I need a technology which is going to allow me to capture the why. And I went to literate programming. Now, literate programming is, uh, my quotes are gone. I, I don't even have the quotes, okay. Donald Knuth is a godlike figure in the computer uh, business, and he was going to write a book that is covering all of computer science. In the 1960s, you could do this. So he set out to do it. He sends the book to the publisher. The publisher sends it back, and he says, this is complete crap. So he decides he's going to write a text layout markup language. How many people know what LaTeX is? LaTeX if you're near Boston. OK, that's Donald Knuth. Okay. He set out to write that because his book looked like crap. And he started to write it, and he got partway through it, and he studied how it's done. And then he said, but the fonts, I'm doing mathematics. I need Greek fonts. So he stopped doing that, and he did a thing called Metafont. Who's ever heard of Metafont? He mathematically analyzed fonts, wrote a program to take that mathematics and generate fonts so he could generate a layout program so he could write a book, OK? <laughs> the publishing industry lives on LaTeX. It, if you open most books and look in the back, in the fine print, it says, this was laid out by LaTeX, OK? That's Donald Knuth. Um, and he said the most fundamental thing which you need to know, which is, you do not want to write things that communicate to the machine. You want to write so you communicate from human to human. It is vitally important to do the communication from human to human. And that's a really poor phrasing of what he said. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have his quote. But I have developed what I call the Hawaii test. Okay? What I want you to do is take a program in book form, in a literate form. You take this program, you hand it to a programmer, you send them to Hawaii for a two-week, all-expense paid vacation. When they come back, they should be able to, do, to modify and maintain that program as well as the original authors. If you have the ability to do that, you have a literate program, and you have passed the Hawaii test. Of course, as one person said, well, if I had a two-week all-expense paid vacation in Hawaii, I wouldn't do anything. To which my response is, well, you're not a programmer. Um, <laughs> the, because, you know, you're sitting there, oh, that's just fantastic stuff. You know? um, so what, what is literate programming, really? First of all, LaTeX has a markup language. It says, 
here's the paragraphs, here's the subparagraphs, here's the thing you want a bold font, here's this, you know, I want this font in here with a slant and all the rest of the stuff. And in this document, you're actually going to embed the source code. So I'm going to take a piece of source code and just put a mark around it and say, this is a chunk of source code, and it's called Bob. And here's the end of the chunk, and it's going to quote this source code in between. So I have this book, and what I want to do now is take the source code out of the book and build the system from the source code. And at the same time, LaTeX has a markup language, which you can just run against this book, and you get a document, you get a PDF file. Okay? One of my demonstrations, and watch the demonstration here, you know, uh, one of the demonstrations I have in about a minute and a half, right here, what I'm going to do is, you'll see me type, and it's great, and all I do is I type make. How many people know what make is? Okay, make is just an automated system that lets you do things. I type make, and what it does is it takes my document, and it does two things. It runs across it, it extracts all of the code, that's happening right here, it's extracting the code, it extracts 139 files, and then it compiles those 139 files, and they're in Java, and this sits on top of the Java virtual machine. Then it extracts several hundred other files, and that's the Lisp code, and then on top of that, it runs all of the tests, which are all in the book, okay? And at the end, what you get is a command prompt, and you can type Lisp at it. So from the book, I have a running Lisp system. How many people know what Clojure is? Anybody? Yeah. This, there's a book I have on my website. You can just download the book, you take out the, the make file, and you run it, and you get a, a running copy of Clojure, okay, from scratch. The second thing it does, right after it puts up the command prompt, is right over here, you're seeing it's building the PDF and you get the latest copy of the book. <laughs> and all you did was type make. Okay? If you want to change this thing, you go into the, the original document, you make your changes, you type in there, and you type make. And it rebuilds the book, and it rebuilds the command prompt. And it runs all of the tests. Okay? So what does that mean for you? What that means for you is that programming teams need an editor-in-chief. That's you. Nobody, and I've completely diverged from my talk, by the way, but, <laughs> but nobody should be able to check in any code into the repository at all until you say this code has the explanation with it. With, how many people know that programmers occasionally do uh, code reviews before they actually check in code? Anybody? Okay. So the idea is, you know, I'm a programmer. I've been programming for 42 years. Okay. And it, when you go to check in a piece of code, you, you hand out your code, people come in a room and they say, well, I don't like, you know, you have a, the braces should be on a separate line as opposed to the same line. And that's about all you can say. Because I have no idea what your task is. Why are you doing this? I'm, I'm so busy doing my stuff, I have to fill my head with your task. But if you hand me a page or two of written communication, this is why I'm doing this, and this is how I'm doing it, I can read that and then look at your code and say, is that what you're doing? Really? Because if you're supposed to be doing this, and you forgot about this case, or this isn't right. If that's for me, I'm not here, by the way. Um, so the... They're ringing in my ears. As I get older, it really gets much more intense. Uh, the, I, I don't, you didn't hear that, but that's just me. Um, can you see it in my eyes? Uh, so anyway, the point I was about to make was that um, if I have the paragraphs that say what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, and I have the code, I can compare the two, and I can understand what your task is, and are you doing it right? If you collect all of these things up and put them in book form, what you have is a literate document. And the literate document is the, the program. If you have a company, and your company depends on a program, 
what happens is that you hire a bunch of developers, they develop it, and then you have them off doing something else. Here's a story for you. So I have a friend, and she went to a bank in New York City, which will remain unnamed, and she's a programmer, and they wander her around the building, and she wanders in to the one place, and they say, look at our huge, it's a room about this big, look at our huge computer. It's a Wang mainframe. She's like, what? Wang, none of you have heard of Wang. Wang only makes mini computers. Okay, they make things about the size of this thing originally, and they got smaller. They only make mini computers. And she said, oh, they don't make mainframes. And they said, well, we, it's a special order. Said, what? Well, we have this algorithm called fructurization. And we use it internationally on everything we do, and the mini computers couldn't handle it. So we had a special order contract, many millions of dollars, with Wang to build this magnificent computer. Okay. So... That's fine. Two years later, she's leaving the company. They have an all-hands meeting. She's got nothing better to do with her life, so she picks up her badge. And as she sees, she picks up her badge, she sees a badge next to hers that says, Joseph Fructor. She's like, Fructor. Fructorization. Fructor. Hmm. I'll wait till he comes around. So this old guy, like me, comes staggering in, you know, picks up his badge, says, ah, hi, you know, I'm Chris, et cetera, et cetera. You know about that that Wang mainframe? And he said, Wang doesn't make mainframes. <laughs> he said, well, they run, it, they run the fructurization algorithm. Have you ever heard of it? He said, well, I wrote it. He said, well, they, they told me they built this Wang, Wang mainframe because they lost the source code. And he said, what are they talking about? It's on the shelf in my office. <laughs> okay. That's going to happen to you. Okay. That's going to ha I'm telling you, I, I'm coming to you from the past. This <laughs> will happen to you. Okay? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Okay? And I'm telling you, it will happen in your company. Your company is going to depend on a piece of software, and you're going to get stuck in the fructurization problem. Because you let go of the people who developed it. And you're going to bring in new people. And as a programmer, I know what happens. You look at a piece of code and say, this is crap. And you rewrite it. And the reason it's crap is because people have sent in bug reports. And people fix the code and said, oh, well, that's a case I didn't think about. Or this is wrong. Or this has to be changed. And you run into another problem. This is the other thing. See this number up here? This number 153. Okay. <laughs> there's a, there's a, a book. It's called Implementing Elliptic Curve, Elliptic Curve Cryptography. Okay, which it's, it's a C program, but it's done as a literate program. And in that book, he, de he defines a thing called num bits, and it's 153. This is the kind of thing I see in Axiom. There's a, a number. It's a magic number. What a programmer will de do is say, well, in this little routine, I need it to be 160. So I'll just sort of redefine it, but only in this little routine, because I don't know what the 153 means. But I need to do it to be 160 here. So they'll have little patches that now disagree with the global information. Because they don't know why that 153 is there. Well, if you actually look in this guy's book, he says, oh, 153. It's a completely arbitrary number I was working with. It can be anything. Okay. That sentence immediately has transmitted a piece of information that will keep 153 from being a magic godlike number. Okay? If he disappeared and didn't write that sentence, nobody would ever reverse engineer what 153 is. Why that magic number is there. That's what I'm running into with Axiom. So I've been working on Axiom now for, oh, uh, it's about 12 years maybe 13 years now, as open source. It's 1.2 million lines of commonless code. It's over a million lines now of literate LaTeX. Um, I have a website called actiondeveloper.org. Um, and what you will find on there, and, and if you look on Wikipedia, and you look up Axiom and, and me on Wikipedia, you'll see the volumes. I have 20 volumes so far. Somebody said, oh, yeah, we should have, you know, small documents. I disagree. 
you should have documents that are 7,000 and 8,000 pages long like I do so far. Okay. I'm serious. I'm serious. What happens with a, with a book? If you want to look something up in a book, what do you do? If it's a big topic, you go to the table of contents. If it's a small topic, you go to the index. And you look up the thing, and it's PDF, right? In the index, you go to the index, you click on the thing, and it takes you to the page you're in. Why do you care that it's 7,000 pages? You're looking for something. You're looking for a piece of information. Books traditionally have ways of organizing this stuff. Not only that, you have the cross-references, right? So I can go in there, and the cross-reference not only tells me who this program calls, it tells me who calls this piece of program, which is really interesting, because if I'm going to change this piece of program, I can see all of the places it's called from, and I'm looking in the index. Okay? So you need to get in between the developers and the repository, and you need to tell them, we're writing a book on this project. And you cannot check in a piece of code without telling me the rest of the story around this piece of code. And I'm not going to let you check it in until that piece of code and that story agree. And if you change it, you need to change the story. And then I will deign to let you check it in. You can't just check it in because you feel like it or because the brace thing is right. You're vital to what this company knows. You are the information this company needs. It's not a question of have a pirate day, whoever did that talk, I'm sorry about that. You need to walk up, strut up to your management and say, you're doing it wrong. We are vital. If this program disappears, does it affect the company? Will it impact this company? If the answer is yes, then you need to step up and get in between the developers and their checking in of the code. Okay. That's the key message there. Um, let me see what else I forgot here, because I have no idea where I was or what I was doing. Um, the literate programming is a very simple idea. It's, it's write a book. And oh, by the way, the book has the actual executable source code in it. There's no other executable source code anywhere else. It's not hidden on Fructor's shelf. It's a book. And it's big. But you don't care that it's big. 6, 000, Axiom now is up to, oh, I don't know, 100,000 pages at this point. I still have a quarter million lines of code I have to rewrite that are still not in the books. I have 1.3 million lines of test cases that are not in the books yet. Okay. This is the, the theme of Axiom is the 30-year horizon. And I don't expect to ever get to that horizon. Okay. But the, the key is, the question is, how do I make this program live? And if your company like this bank in New York City lives on that program, you are the people that make it live. You are vitally important. And I will come and convince your management that you are vitally important. I'm serious. It, a program, I, I programmed for a living, and I never had to face my own code before. And I'm looking at my own code, of which I am the world's expert in my own code, and I don't understand it. There's a message there. You're going to hire people, and then you're going to let them move on. And you're going to lose the vital thing in the company. Go back to your management, kick in the door, and say, I am vital to your company. This is not optional. This is not documentation. Literate programming is not documentation. Okay? Literate programming is telling a story, communicating from this human to somebody they will never meet. That's why you send them to Hawaii for two weeks. You're going to communicate to somebody they will never meet. That's the goal of literate programming. There's more. <laughs> I, I, I have no memory. You know, I'm old and, and I got a ringing in my ears and I can't remember anything. But, and I have no idea where my time went, 
but that's essentially what the message is. Go back to your company, tell them you got to talk to this guy because you heard it someplace in Portland, you know, you, that, that you're vital and that you're going to change the way they develop code. Tell them that. They have to change it because that's the, the message. I'm here as the evangelist. My name is Tim Daly. If you Google Axiom and Daly, I'm up on the first page. Okay, I'm, I'm there someplace. Nobody else cares. Axiom and Daily, you know, um, and I'm, you know, I'm on the web. You can send me email, daily at axiom-developer.org, um, and I'm currently unemployed, actually, because the last company had a contract with the government, and the government decided that, you know, they're going to sequester or whatever. So, um, but the, the point, the, just... Take that point home. That's all you need. That's a, what I'm evangelizing. I had great words. I had great pictures. You'd love the pictures. And your mascot, by the way, should be Donald Knuth. Okay. I'm telling you now, change, look up what he's done. Look at his effect on your business. Look at the literate programming and change your mascot to Donald Knuth. Because this man has defined your industry. Okay. Questions, comments, snide remarks? I, I apologize for the, uh, my incompetence with computers because, you know, I'm all... There you go. <laughs> what can I say? Yeah, I don't know if you uh, remember me from a few years back, but I was... Uh, my name's Ed Baraski, or Z-N-E-B, oh, yeah, yeah, and I, I used to hack on Axiom. I think you're in the credits list, actually. Probably. If you look on the... On, uh, I am a big fan... You know, here's another little minor thing. If somebody does some work on this thing, put their name in the credits list. If they send you a bug report, put their name in the credits list. Yeah. Credit is stolen in this business. You write, you write, you do all of this stuff, and then somebody rewrites it and they put their name on it. Credit is cheap to share. Put their name. The credit list for Axiom is about 300 people now. Okay. Ed, yeah. I Any believe, is in that list. Anyway, uh, I... I, I <laughs> Could, it could very well be, I, actually. Uh, I just wanted to, I wanted to ask you to put the slides up on, uh, on the website anyway, even though you didn't get a chance to run them here. If I'm capable of it, I, apparently not. But, you know, sure, yeah, that, they'll definitely be up on the and website. Uh, you're, you're still axiom... axiom dash developer dash dot developer org. Dot org. Okay, yeah. Right. Okay, good. Uh, any more questions? Questions? Moods? Oh, right Anybody here. have a mood they want to set? Um, so suppose that you wanted to approach literate programming in your organization, but there's no way they're actually going to write all the code in the LaTeX document, or at least you don't have the influence to change to that radical and extreme. They're going to continue writing the code, and they're going to continue writing code comments. What, what are the most important things to think about to encourage, assuming you can't achieve the ideal? I know that, that's pessimism, talk to but. the <laughs> talk to the programmers mm -hmm. and say, "Look, all I want you to do is write a couple of paragraphs at the code review, mm -hmm. okay, and include them in the check-in. Not as comments. We're not looking to comment the API. Mm -hmm. That's a separate kind of documentation. We're not looking to do this. What we're what I want to know is why are you writing this and what are you trying to achieve, so that I can look at what." you're supposed to be doing and look at the code that you have and say, are you doing what you said you'd do? There's a, there's a link, by the way, if you go to uh, axiomdeveloper.org slash axiom-website slash litprog dot html. That's a literate program done in HTML. Um, and I don't have the slides for the technology, the, this stuff. But, but that's an example that you would use, that you could show the programmers and say, this is what we're talking about. We want to be able to explain what you're trying to do at this level. That's all I'm asking you to do. And check it in this way. Because what they're essentially doing is writing the, the paragraphs or the sections of the book as well as what they're doing. They're, they're saying why they bothered to write the code and what it was intended to do. 
So the next person that comes along that tries to look at the code can read this and say, oh, that's what he was intended to do. Man, is he confused. Or we don't need to do that anymore. Or we're doing it completely differently. And, and they don't have to reverse engineer the code to figure that out. Okay, that would be at least, and try to get yourself invited to these meetings. So you can proofread it and say, well, that's not even an English sentence. You know, <laughs> um, of course, you're in Japan at the time, but yeah, details, details. <laughs> you know, at, at least get that level where you're trying to get yourself invited to the meetings and get your influence at the point where they're trying to check the code in so that you can get that level of documentation and say, look, give me the paragraphs, give everybody that attends the meeting the paragraphs so that they can say, oh, here's what it's supposed to do, right? And compare what the code actually does. That's the first step I would take. Get yourself between the programmer and the repository. And if you non-concur if you're an IBMer, um, but if, if you decide I don't agree, your word should matter, okay? No, you can't check this in yet. Next question. There's a prize if I question. get the three questions. Uh, over here? Okay, cool. Pardon. Uh, I had a much more exciting presentation put together, I, I assure you. I, well, I, I think you should talk without slides more often. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> So there was a mention in kind of the Drupal talk yesterday, and I'm kind of from the Django world, and they do something very similar where they have all of their code is, uh, all their documentation is in the code in the same repository, and they use pull requests as this way of kind of gatekeeping. I can tell by your shaking your head you don't agree with this. Um, what would you say was the best kind of process to actually say, like to establish a gate so that you can stop things from not being documented this is, this is, if you talk to a programmer about this, they're going to hear, oh, I'm documenting. Here's the mindset change. This is the mindset change. You want to communicate from human to human, okay? And, oh, by the way, there's some code. Not, I write code and, oh, there's some documentation in the code. Or, we'll use Javadoc or Doxygen or we'll use, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Wrong thinking. Listen for it. Programmers can't get past the code. You need to think about this as though you're writing a book and they're writing a little section of the book. You're writing a book to explain to anybody that cares from the user level documentation to the detail level of documentation what this thing does. That's a mindset change. That's not a technique. This is a whole new shift of the game. You're writing a book, and this person has come in, and you're going to let them contribute to the book. Do not let programmers tell you that it's programming, that it's just documentation. Don't use the word documentation. Stop using it, because programmers think documentation is a comment at the end of the program, or you know the little paragraph they do in nice, nice little stars at the front. That's what they mean by documentation. Stop using that word. Because the programmers here, oh, God, documentation. Stop using the word. You're writing a book. Change the mindset. You're writing a book. Okay? And you want it to be consistent. You're an editor-in-chief. This book should read so that somebody can sit down and read it. There's, there's a book uh, implementing the elliptic curve cryptography. There's a great book, the absolute best book. It's called Lisp in Small Pieces. Okay? That's a fantastic book. You can sit and read it, and he, he builds up everything he needs to know. It's a complete Lisp system with the debugger and the compiler and everything else, and you can sit and read it. And he explains the ideas really clearly. And it's a literate program. All of the code in the book is the code you need. You're now editors-in-chief, and you're commissioning books in your company. Change your mindset. Stop using the word documentation. It's a, it's a, it immediately undercuts your position, and now you're just one of the people on the side. Okay? That's what you need to change. That's what you need to convince your management to change. And I can tell you, having come from the past, and come sneaking in the door here, 
<laughs> By the way, you need Sonny to stop writing this stuff in code and you write some book, okay? <laughs> it's important. I am one of the few people in the world who has experienced the past, okay? Because I've been in this business since when I started doing patch cords in this business. So you program by pushing wires into holes. I have worked on everything. I worked on mainframes, minis, workstations. The last thing I did was a game for my phone. You know, it's, I know everything there is to know about this business and I've come to tell you, you're doing it wrong. We're all doing it wrong. And you guys are important. And you need to realize that you're important and you need to get out of this documentation game and into the book publishing game.